Have you ever just wanted a do-over in life? Do you want that feeling of a brand new, fresh start? Did you know that Jesus offers that to you right now? If you are wondering how that is possible, stay with me, friends. My name is Cami Utman, and this is Unlocking Bible Prophecies. The rise of an international pandemic, about the coronavirus. polarizing global politics, the mismanagement and corruption, increasingly destructive natural disasters, and the bushfires in Australia are a warning of what may be to come around the world. What does it all mean? What does the future hold? Join international speaker Kami Utman on a journey for answers in unlocking Bible prophecies. In her travels around the world, she's come face to face with real life struggles, but in the midst of them, she's found miracles of hope. Join Kami Utman for Unlocking Bible Prophecies as she shares how Bible prophecy is being fulfilled faster than ever before. Can you believe that we are on topic number 13 of 14 for Unlocking Bible Prophecies? I would love to know how many of you have watched all 13 sessions so far. Let us know in the chat the number of presentations you have watched. It's so fun for us to see. It has been a privilege to spend these evenings with you. Yesterday's program was a thrilling study of prophecy. Many of you expressed how encouraged you are to know that God has a people that He is preparing for the end time. He is coming to rescue us soon and take us home to heaven for eternity. If you and I do not meet here on this earth, friend, I look forward to meeting you inside the holy city on the streets of gold. Now, if you have missed any programs, go to awr.org forward slash Bible for an archive of the entire series. Since the topics build on each other, please be sure to try and watch them in order. And remember, we have a team of dedicated online Bible instructors eager to help you with any question you may have. Just click the link to connect with us. Plus, you can enroll in our online Bible school where millions have grown spiritually with these lessons by clicking to enroll for free. Tonight, we will look at the new life, a fresh start that is available through Jesus. You know, I was amazed when I first joined Adventist World Radio and witness two whole villages hike 48 miles through jungle mountains to meet us at a waterfall for baptism. What a beautiful event. They had been studying their Bibles with their radios and wanted a new life in Jesus. What does a new beginning look like? How can you experience a clean slate? Let's pray together before we dive into tonight's topic. Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you so much for providing us with your word so that we have a clear understanding of what you desire for us and from us. Lord, help us to uh, have a deeper understanding and fall deeper in love with you And um, tonight as we look at this topic of baptism together, Lord. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Come with me as we look to our perfect example found in Matthew chapter 3. We can visualize Jesus making his way on a dusty trail to meet John the Baptist for the first time. Something unprecedented is about to happen. Jesus hikes from Nazareth down to the Jordan River. A buzzing, excited multitude is gathered on the riverbank. The crowd is enthralled by John's words, Repent and be baptized, for the kingdom of God is at hand. As John is in the midst of his thundering discourse, he suddenly stops. For a moment, there is silence. His eyes zero in on one man. He has never sensed such pure, holy character. The crowd noticed the pause. Who is John staring at? A feverish hum of whispers spread throughout the congregation. Who is that guy? They do not recognize their kingly Messiah. Even though John has never seen him before, the Holy Spirit reveals, this is the Son of God. Jesus' eyes meet John's and requests baptism. 
But John vigorously tries to talk him out of it. I am the one who needs to be baptized by you. And John says, so why are you coming to me? But Jesus says, it should be done, for we must carry out all that God requires. So John agreed to baptize him. He yields and leads the Savior down into the Jordan waters. As the two men stand in the water, we can picture John putting one hand on Jesus' back and raising his other hand toward heaven. The crowd is in awe, and Jesus is immersed, buried beneath the water. And as Jesus comes up out of the water, a new and important era is opening before him. He is now on a wider stage. His ministry has begun. He knows that he is entering the conflict of his life. He exits onto the bank with water streaming from his garment, making little mud pools in the dust. It was then that the heavens opened and John sees the Spirit of God descending like a dove and settling on Jesus. The people stand silent, gazing upon Christ. His form is bathed in light. His upturned face is glorified like they have never seen before. And suddenly, a voice from heaven is heard saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. In John chapter 1, we see that John the Baptist is so deeply moved that with an outstretched hand, he points to Jesus. Behold, the one we are looking for is in our midst, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world. Friend, it is impossible for you and me to fully understand or appreciate the intense electrifying effect of that very announcement. For thousands of years, mankind had been waiting for their Redeemer. Israel had been living under the severe oppression of Rome and longing for their Messiah. And now, suddenly, the desire of the ages, the hope of all nations, is standing in their midst. Baptism is a crucial part of the Christian life. Not only was Jesus baptized as an example to us, but he also strongly admonished his people to be baptized. Baptism is a symbol of our willingness to accept the gospel of Jesus. It is a conscious decision and proclamation. We will see that baptism is a symbolic act that it is thoroughly covered in the Bible. Many people have misconceptions about its significance and are confused about whether it is necessary for salvation. So why do we need baptism and what does it mean? Let us go to some important verses in the Bible to outline the necessity of baptism and what we need to do to prepare for it. We can demonstrate our faithfulness and loyalty by following Christ's example in baptism. God is calling each one of us to take a public stand. The truths of God's word give us something to stand on. Our theme for this series is, if it's in the Bible, I believe it. If it disagrees with the Bible, it's not for me. All of us at times have wished that we could just start over with a new life, a clean record. Well, the book of Revelation repeatedly refers to this opportunity. Revelation 1 verse 5, To him who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. That tells us that Jesus washes evil from our lives so we can start over. Revelation 3 8, I know your works. See, I have set before you an open door. Jesus sets before us an open door to a new life. The book of Revelation reveals a God of incredible love who never forces our allegiance or coerces our will. Throughout the book of Revelation, he invites us to come to him 
freely. He says, Revelation 22, 17, whoever desires, let him take the water of life freely. In Revelation, Jesus is pictured as the lamb who dies to gain our ultimate freedom. God is calling out people to be faithful to him. He is calling them to lovingly keep his commandments. Jesus invites them to publicly acknowledge and proclaim their loyalty, to declare their allegiance to him. Now, how do we take a stand? Revelation points us in the right direction. Jesus instructed his disciples in Matthew 28, 19 and 20, Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. When we are baptized, we declare our allegiance by taking a public stand, showing whose side we are on. Yet many Christians are confused over this basic Bible ordinance. How many kinds of baptisms are there? Some churches sprinkle babies. Others pour water over the head of a baby or young child. And one denomination practices olive oil baptism. I even read of a church that sprinkled rose petals over the heads of its youth, declaring they were now baptized. One pastor took his youth out into the mountains and so-called baptized them by letting them lay in the snow and covering them with it. When he was questioned about this method, he said, it doesn't make any difference whether the water is liquid or solid. Was this pastor right? The Bible declares that there is only one true method of baptism. It clearly says in Ephesians 4 verse 5, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. If we take God at his word, then there is only one biblical method. Wouldn't you agree with me that the best way to know the true method of baptism is to read it in the Bible? If we are baptized the same way Jesus was, we certainly cannot go wrong. Mark 1 verse 9, It came to pass in those days that Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. Matthew 3, 16 and 17, When he had been baptized, Jesus came up immediately from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting upon him. And suddenly a voice came from heaven, saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Jesus was immersed. When Christ was baptized, he went down into the water and came up out of the water. Jesus' baptism by full immersion was a significant event in his life. Your baptism will be a significant event in your life. There were two special things that happened to Jesus at his baptism. First, the Holy Spirit descended upon Jesus to give him supernatural spiritual power to face the temptation of the evil one. The Bible promises that when we are baptized, we too will receive that same spiritual power, that same spiritual help. Don't you desire this spiritual power in your life, friend? It came upon Jesus, and it also will be given to us. He received divine power at his baptism. And as we, by faith, open our hearts to the Lord, we will receive the Holy Spirit at our baptism too. The scripture says in Acts 10 verse 38, God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. I love that. The second thing that happened at Jesus' baptism was what the Father spoke to him in Matthew 3.17, saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Every time a child of God responds to the call of Christ 
and is baptized, taking a public stand for our Lord, all of heaven rejoices. When you are baptized, once again, the Father will say, this is my beloved son. This is my beloved daughter in whom I am well pleased. Believers down through the centuries have experienced the joy of making a full commitment to Christ through baptism. Sometimes they have been the only member of their family or village or tribe to, to come forward. You see, God calls each of us individually. He certainly did that with the Ethiopian eunuch returning from Jerusalem. As the Ethiopian was riding in his chariot, he was also reading scripture. God miraculously led Philip to him. Philip clearly explained the word of God to this prominent Ethiopian. He answered his Bible questions and made a strong appeal for this man to fully, completely dedicate his life to Christ. The Ethiopian immediately responded. Thrilled with his new relationship with Jesus, he desired to be baptized. His request is found in Acts 8, 36 to 39. Now, as they went down the road, they came to some water. And the eunuch said, See, here is water. What hinders me from being baptized? Then Philip said, If you believe with all your heart, you may. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. So he commanded the chariot to stand still. And both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water and he baptized him. Now when they came up out of the water, hmm, see, these verses right here teach us some vital truths about baptism. The Ethiopian was baptized when he openly accepted Christ. His baptism was, baptism was a public decision that he was taking a stand, and both Philip and the Ethiopian went down into the water, and Philip lowered the Ethiopian and fully immersed him into the cool, deep water as a symbol of Christ's ability to cleanse the entire person from sin. The whole person must be immersed because the whole person has sinned. Every part of us must go under the water because every part of us has sinned. Friends, we need a lot more than sprinkling. We want to be cleansed totally, and God requires Bible baptism, full immersion. In fact, you may not be aware of the meaning of the word baptism. The Greek word baptizo or baptize means to dip, to immerse, to plunge under water. For example, if a Greek woman desired to completely change the color of a piece of cloth, she wouldn't just sprinkle little dots of dye onto the cloth. She would plunge it under the water. Baptism by immersion was certainly the practice of the ancient churches. Archaeology reveals baptismal sites found in these churches in the early centuries. Ancient churches expose the method of baptism used then. Here's an ancient ch uh, Christian church site with a baptistry near Ephesus, near the western shores of modern-day Turkey. The size of the pool-like structure, according to archaeologists and historians, demonstrates the fact that in those days, only adults were baptized by immersion. This is an early Christian church in Philippi. In the remains of the church, we see an early baptistry where New Testament Christians baptized believers by immersion. St. John of Lateran is the second largest church in Rome. It is the most famous church in Rome next to St. Peter's Cathedral. If you walk through the narrow alleyway to the back of the church, you dis discover something quite remarkable, a beautiful baptistry, clearly showing that Roman Catholicism practiced baptism by immersion. They continued this practice as late as the 13th century. The baptistries in these ancient churches reveal that the church practiced Bible baptism by immersion for hundreds of years. 
and here you can see the Leaning Tower of Pisa. You may be familiar with the Bell Tower, which is world famous because of the angle at which it is leaning, but you may not be as familiar with the baptistry behind the tower, where Roman Catholics practice baptism by immersion for centuries. One of the most remarkable baptistries in the world is found in Cappadocia, a city of refuge deep within the caves of southeast Turkey. Here, Christians found refuge from their oppressors in the Middle Ages, the Dark Ages. Let's enter through the carved rock into the secret city of refuge, their place of worship. We see carved in a rock a baptistry where these faithful Christians were baptized by full immersion. Immersion was a practice of the New Testament church. Jesus was baptized by immersion. The disciples, the early church, and believers through the centuries have followed this biblical practice. It was not until the church, or excuse me, the Council of Ravenna in AD 1311 that sprinkling and pouring were officially accepted. Sprinkling became as equally valid as immersion in the rite of baptism. The church introduced sprinkling as a more convenient method. Many people delayed baptism until they were near death when it became difficult for them to be immersed. So gradually, over many years, sprinkling was accepted as equally valid as immersion. Friends, during this series, we have seen many practices that have gradually slipped into the Christian church, which have no foundation in scripture. For example, Sunday worship, the concept of the immortal, immortal soul, and now sprinkling. God is calling us back to the Bible, back to the true biblical method of baptism. What is the meaning of Bible baptism? Romans 6, 3 and 4. Or do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Therefore, we are buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so, we also should walk in newness of life. When you go into the water, it is saying, Lord, I accept your death on the cross for me. It is saying, I want my old way of life to be buried, and I want to live a new life in Christ. Friends, baptism represents dying to your old sinful way of life. Is there something you did a year ago, five years ago, ten years ago, that still haunts you today? Something that troubles your soul and keeps you up at night? When you walk into the waters of baptism, you are dying to all those sins of the past. Your guilt and condemnation can be gone. Your past is wiped clean. The act of baptism itself has no magic. There are no spiritual properties in the water. It is symbolic and important nonetheless. In order to fully live in Christ, we must first fully die to our old lives. In my travels, no matter where in the world, no matter which culture, I see the same happy expressions on the faces of those that have just been baptized. I have witnessed those precious moments when a newborn Christian comes up out of the water. Their eyes are filled with joy, acceptance, and inner peace. You can sense that they know their slate has been wiped clean and their whole being radiates excitement. No matter what their lives were like before that moment, they now know they can start over and with the help of the Holy Spirit, live changed lives. Baptism is like burying your sins in a watery grave. But you may think, wait a minute, doesn't God forgive me every time I confess my sin? Absolutely, he does. As it says in 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful 
and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. As you step into the water, you are demonstrating, God, I give myself to you, all the sins that I remember and all the sins that I don't. Because we can't remember every sin we have committed, friends. Lord, I'm so grateful that when I come up out of the water, I am a new person with a new slate as I begin a new life. You know, friends, I have had a lot of incredible adventures and experiences throughout my life. Some the world would even deem ultimate accomplishments. But I want to tell you something. Nothing compares to witnessing souls giving themselves to Jesus in baptism, accepting eternal life. My team and I go to great lengths to be at baptisms anywhere that we can in the world. I remember when we heard about a village high up in the mountains of the Philippines. They had been listening to our radio programs about Jesus and Bible truth and were wanting baptism. There were only two ways you could reach them in their village, either by horseback, which took a little longer, or motorcycle. I voted for motorcycles. We crossed 24 streams and zoomed up hillsides to make our winding way to the top. And we were welcomed by dozens of smiling, beautiful children. And as we trekked to the nearby stream, we were able to witness 18 commit their lives to Jesus that day. When those precious people rise up out of baptismal water, they walk in newness of life. This is a symbol of the resurrection, coming up out of that watery grave. Now, do you have to wait until you are perfect before you get baptized? No. Baptism does not mean you are flawless. It means you are committed. So if you are hesitating to be baptized because you think you need to wait until you're perfect, friend, then you will never go through with it. Baptism shows your commitment to God, to God, your decision to follow His ways. Baptism is not the end of the Christian life. It is just the beginning. With a new sense of direction and freedom, we say, God, I am yours. Guide me and use me. Baptism gives us a new spiritual power in our lives, friends. So let's look at what happens when we are baptized. We see that every sin is forgiven. Acts 2 verse 38, Then Peter said to them, Repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. The Apostle Peter makes it clear that everyone should be baptized. Hmm. Wait a minute, then what about the thief on the cross? He was never baptized. After such a heartfelt exchange, the Savior promised the thief that he would be remembered and saved to God's kingdom. There was no opportunity for the thief to be baptized at that point when he gave his life to Christ while hanging on the cross. Jesus knew he would be baptized if he could. We know that Jesus never sinned. Christ himself did not need baptism, but he did it as an example for us. Christ's baptism serves for all who, like the thief on the cross, were unable to be baptized, like those on death row, in prisons, or in a hospital bed. I love that the Bible says baptism is for everyone, every precious soul on earth, not just a select few. And at baptism, every sin is forgiven. There is no sin too great. Another promise at the time of baptism is that the Holy Spirit is given to us. Mark 1 verse 10, And immediately coming up from the water, he saw the heavens parting and the Spirit descending upon him like a dove. Let's go back to Acts 2 verse 38 and look at the rest of the text, which says, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. 
God has a gift for you at your baptism. You are cleansed and promised the gift of the Holy Spirit being added to your life. He is your personal helper through life's trials. Scripture describes the Holy Spirit in personal terms when it says that He teaches, guides, comforts, and intercedes. The gift of the Holy Spirit is simply God empowering faithful Christians to do what He has called us to do. By your baptism, you are adopted into God's family. We become part of a body of believers worldwide. Acts 2 verse 41 says, Then those who gladly received the word were baptized, and that day about 3,000 souls were added unto them. Many people wonder how baptism relates to church membership. Did people who were baptized also join the church? Let's go on to verse 42. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, in the breaking of bread and in prayers. Now drop down to verse 47. And we see that they are praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. Amen. Your baptism symbolizes that you have chosen to become a part of God's body of believers. His Sabbath-keeping, commandment-keeping, Adventist Christian people. Just like we read they continued steadfastly in the Apostles' Doctrine and Fellowship, God asks that you find a church that follows in harmony with the teachings of His Word. When you are baptized, your sins are forgiven. Not only is your life cleansed, but you receive the Holy Spirit and become part of a worldwide Sabbath-keeping fellowship, an international community of faith. God is leading people of all nationalities, of all languages, and of all religious persuasions to His last day, final movement. Let's review what steps a person needs to take before being baptized. First, we must repent and have a genuine sorrow for our sin. Have you come to Jesus and said, Lord, I believe that only you can forgive my sins, as you alone are my Savior. If you have, you have taken the first step on this journey of faith. Repentance is being sorry enough for your sins that you are willing to turn away from your old lifestyle. Repentance means your attitude towards your sins has changed. You no longer want to do them. They are no longer attractive to you. Secondly, we must believe and accept that Jesus is both Savior and Lord of our lives. And lastly, we must continue to learn and receive instruction in the essentials of biblical faith. Once you understand the basics of Bible faith, the essential truths of His Word, God invites you to make the decision to be baptized. Many wonder about infant baptism. James 4.17 tells us, Therefore, to him who knows to do good and does not do it, to him it is sin. Obviously, infants do not know about sin yet. They cannot make a conscious decision. Infants are unable to repent of their sins. Infant baptism is never promoted in the scriptures. The doctrine of infant baptism is of pagan origin and was brought into the church by Roman Catholicism. As with most Catholic doctrines, infant baptism has its origins in the Babylonian mysteries. In Babylon, new birth was honored by baptism of infants. European pagans sprinkled their newborns or immersed them. To this day, the holy water used for baptism in some circles is still prepared according to the pagan custom of plunging a torch from the altar into the water. Having introduced infant baptism, the Roman Catholic Church was fiercely opposed to adults being baptized and even issued the following decree in the book History of Romanism, page 510, quote, let him be accursed who says adults must be baptized, end quote. 
During this series of presentations, you may have learned new truths from God's Word. Then the time has come to commit to follow Jesus all the way into Bible baptism. But what if you have already been baptized? Do you need to be baptized again? There is an instance in the Bible when people were rebaptized. Here it is. The Apostle Paul was preaching in the upper coast of Ephesus, and a group of people came to him. In Acts 19, verses 2 to 5, describes it like this. Paul said to them, Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? So they said to him, We have not so much as heard whether there is a Holy Spirit. And he said to them, Into what then were you baptized? So they said, Into John's baptism. Then Paul said, John indeed baptized with a baptism of repentance, saying to the people that they should believe on him who would come after him, that is, on Christ Jesus. When they heard this, they were rebaptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Paul instructed them more fully, and though they had once been baptized by immersion already, Paul did rebaptize them by immersion. They wanted to walk in all the light of God's word. These are two reasons to consider rebaptism. An individual may desire to be rebaptized if they once were baptized, but left their life with Christ. They wandered away from God, but now they long to return to Him. You don't get rebaptized every time you sin, because if you did, people would spend a whole lot of time in the baptismal pool. But if you intentionally turn your back to, on Christ, baptism by immersion is a symbol of death to the old way of life and resurrection to the new way. Is God moving on your heart tonight? Maybe you have slipped away over the years. Maybe you've backslidden or drifted away. It's okay. Jesus is ready for you to return to him. His arms are open wide. When we look around our world, we see the signs that this world is amping up. Jesus is preparing his people for his soon return. Now is the time to get serious about the Lord. Come back to your Savior and be rebaptized. Someone may also desire to be rebaptized if they are committed Christians who have discovered new truth in God's word and desire to be a part of his commandment-keeping people. There are Christians who love Jesus so much with all their hearts that when they study the Bible and learn new truths, like John's disciples did, they add these new truths to what they already believed. You too may wish to be rebaptized. If this is your desire, there is a biblical precedence for being rebaptized. If you are a Christian, by going into the water, you are not denying your prior Christian experience. When John's disciples were rebaptized, they did not deny their previous walk with God. How important is baptism? Nicodemus came seeking Jesus at night. We must know that baptism is so important that we are told in John 3 verse 5, Jesus answered, Most assuredly, I say to you, Unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Jesus said water baptism is essential for salvation. Jesus' cross, which is of priceless importance, is mentioned 28 times in the New Testament, whereas baptism is mentioned over a hundred times. No one should treat it as a non-essential at conversion, the change in a person is so radical and crucial. Jesus knows human needs. He knows that we need points of beginning again. Event dates are important so that we can look back on them. It is the same with a wedding ceremony. It sets the date of when our new life with our spouse began. We make a public commitment of love and devotion. The Bible says in Mark 16, verse 16, He who believes and is baptized will be saved. 
The scriptures are our safe and sure guide, and through them we can follow in the footsteps of Jesus, our Savior. It is not enough to believe the gospel. One must live it. 2 Corinthians 6, verse 2. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Friends, there is no need for you to wait. Now is the day to seal your commitment to Jesus in your heart. Acts 22, verse 16. And now why are you waiting? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. All of heaven is waiting for you to take this stand for Jesus, friend. At baptism, a person is unified with Christ. Galatians 3.27 says, For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Baptism is as essential to a Christian as the wedding is to a marriage. Both ceremonies must be based on deep-seated love and full understanding if they are to be meaningful. To refuse baptism is to refuse to be united with Christ. Baptism is a public declaration of a relationship to Jesus. 2 Corinthians 5 verse 17 says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Do you wish to be made new? Is your heart drawing you to Jesus right now? Are you wanting to make him your number one priority? Are you saying, yes, Lord, I want to make a decision for you. I want to follow you you all the way in Bible baptism. Friend, What would be holding you back? Are you scared to make this commitment? Are you afraid of the cost of your decision? Are you thinking that the price of this decision is too high? That it will cost me too much? I want to share a story with you that we filmed on the border of the DMZ between North and South Korea. There is a river on the border of North Korea and China. People from North Korea try to swim this river to escape to China. North Korea has a three-strike rule. If someone escapes once and is caught, they are sent back and imprisoned. The second time, they are severely punished. If they are caught a third time, they are executed. There was a young lady named Kim who was longing for freedom. She wanted to escape to Mongolia so that she could make her way to South Korea. She planned to earn money to send back to help her family. When Kim escaped, she was not a Christian and did not know God. The first time she was caught, she was sent back and put in prison. They warned her, don't try this again or something worse will happen to you. Do you think that stopped Kim? No. She tried a second time, going under the cover of darkness. But someone with a light captured her, and she was punished more severely. They warned her harshly, Kim, if you try this again, you will be executed. Do not try to escape again. But Kim wanted freedom more than anything. So for a third time, at the risk of her life, in the middle of the night, she swam the river again. This time, she made it to the other side. She found her way to the Chinese border, where a very kind Chinese family hid her in their house. While she was there for several months with these dear people, she found a radio. As she was tuning the radio, she heard the familiar words of her Korean language. Now, before I finish this presentation tonight, I want to share with you our Adventist World Radio short film about Kim's escape that will illustrate what one woman chose to go through for her love for Jesus. One night at my church, 
an unfamiliar woman entered and sat near the back. Her face bore hard lines hiding her youth. I wondered who she was. This stranger sat alone on a pew, and after everyone had left, the pastor joined her. I escaped North Korea, she admitted. And I'm not safe here in China either. But I have one request, she said. Will you baptize me? Do you even know what baptism means? I questioned. Yes was her resolute response. I learned about Jesus through the radio. While in hiding, this dear woman found a radio, and tuning it stopped when she heard bits of the familiar Korean language. It was the voice of hope through Adventist World Radio. This discovery soon turned her loneliness and fear into courage and hope as she learned about the one who left all and died for her salvation. A longing was born in her heart to one day go back and share what she was learning with her family and friends in North Korea. We studied the Bible together for one week and she soaked up every word. You could feel the Holy Spirit's presence in the room. After this week of studying, a secret baptism was held. All the doors and windows were closed and everyone sang hymns softly so as not to be heard. And in a lonely bathtub, this North Korean lady was baptized. With tear-stained cheeks and joyous eyes, she declared her allegiance to God alone. After her baptism, she expressed her desire for freedom and the ability to study the Bible at the Adventist University in South Korea. She set off on foot that very night. Sometime later, I received a phone call. The voice on the other line said in a whisper, I have safely arrived to the border. Tonight is the night. Please pray for me. All I could think about were the eight strands of barbed wire. Would she make it? Unfortunately, she did not cross the border that night, but was found by Chinese soldiers who sent her back to her country of birth, where she was executed. I was so saddened to receive this news. I would never see those joyful eyes again. I remembered what she had told me. Even if I am captured, I will die with the hope of salvation. She sought freedom, and what the North Korean soldiers did not realize is, she found it. True freedom in Jesus Christ, and no one could take this from her. Like Kim, there are many others who are also seeking freedom around this world tonight. Friend, are you one of them? Do you want to give your heart to Jesus and claim Him as your personal Savior, regardless of the cost? Are you thinking about being baptized? Is the Holy Spirit moving on your heart right now? Are your thoughts filled with, should I, what if? God says yes, and He is with you in every step you take. Is it your desire to say, yes, Jesus, I want to stand for you publicly. I want to be a part of the millions around the world who have already taken their stand. This is the time to make your decision, friend. Maybe you have slipped away but God is calling you back. This is your time to make a decision. Now is a wonderful opportunity to say, Lord, I want to be baptized. I want my sins cleansed. Pray with me. Heavenly Father, we come before you with outstretched hands tonight in surrender, 
for you to lead us on your path that is homeward bound. May the Holy Spirit work mightily on our hearts right now as we consecrate our lives to you, to follow you through the cleansing waves of baptism. Lord, you know the person who is all alone right now and is struggling to stand for truth because they may be the only one in their family or community. Give them special attention right now, Lord. Comfort them with the knowledge that you will protect and you will provide. Surround them with an army of angels. We know that all of heaven is rejoicing over those that are choosing you tonight. Blessed be the name of Jesus in all the universe. In his holy name, amen. Friends, I hope you are making this eternal decision tonight. There is no time to waste. Today is the day of salvation. Would you let us know if you are thinking about baptism? Click the link now. Would you like to commit to being baptized or rebaptized soon? Just click to connect with us about your decision or any questions that you may have for our Bible instructors tonight. The greatest and most important thing that can happen from unlocking Bible prophecies is for you to draw closer to Jesus and commit your whole life to Him. God bless you, my friend. Meet me back here tomorrow for our final Unlocking Bible Prophecies presentation that's entitled the great controversy. Friends, this is the message that changed my life, personally. Choose God's way. Good night, friends. <laughs>